It was a power-packed program. Following this, we had a new upcoming topic, which is AI and how AI is involved with assessment. Then we had a panel discussion on next, what's next, improving students' outcome in the national exit, exit exam. The much more enjoyed sessions were for the post-lunch where we had uh, in the award uh, session where we had uh, the students who were going through the process of the William Osler Award program. And the students were talking on defining movements in the history of medicine. It was well enjoyed by all. Today, let's start the session with yeah, speed dating. Yeah, I was a part of speed dating also. And uh, where like 10 of us were lucky enough to walk around. Thank you, ma'am. I would now like to invite Dr. Ram Nair to talk on his topic, moving from outcomes to impact of programs, simulation for improving societal outcomes. And for this session, I, I would, would like, like to invite Dr. Dr. Sheila Kurvila, HODDVL, and Dr. Dr. Praveen Jacob, Manager, Academic Tamil Nadu Epic Skills, to chair the session. Good morning to all. It's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker for today, Dr. Ram Nair, CEO of Jeeva Raksha Trust, Bangalore. Uh, sir, uh, he is well known to everyone here. Everyone has either heard of him or knows him. So there's nothing much for me to add, except that he's given up his life in UK and he's come here to help this country establish training for emergency medicine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Praveen. Thank you for being here early this morning. Uh, Vanakam, Gaucha, if I got that right. And uh, I, I'm very honored to be the co-chair here because Ram I consider as a mentor and a friend. Um, as ma'am already mentioned, Ram has been an emergency medicine physician in the NHS for about two decades. He did his undergraduation here, and in 2018, he decided to come back to India. Um, he's going to talk more about Jeeva Raksha, so I'm not going into details, but I'd just like to say that uh, they're doing something which is quite unique. You know, most of us work in a single institution, but Ram and um, Jeeva Raksha work across institutions, across the whole state. So he's bringing that perspective to us today. And uh, he's also going to talk about how um, he has many stories, and you know he's also in an afternoon session which is about using stories to tell the power of uh, work. But uh, one of the stories he talks about is how Seattle changed because of one person. And the same way I think Karnataka pre-hospital care is becoming the model state for the country because of Jeeva Raksha and Ram. So thank you, Ram. We look forward to listening to you. Good morning. You're all still sleepy. Good morning. So, uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, Jeeva Raksha because uh, many of you in the audience don't know what uh, Jeeva Raksha is. Some of you know, and I've got a large number of uh, Jeeva Raksha trainers and providers in the audience. Thank you all. So, um, we're going to talking, uh, talk about impact, which is a term which we introduced about four years ago in training. So, slightly different from the impacts that you're looking at. And then we will talk about these societal outcomes also because we all do a lot of training. I think I'm moving away, that's why, right. yes. Thank you. You know me well. So, we all do a lot of training 
amongst the four wards of wherever we are based, could be departments, could be MEUs, could be skill labs, simulation labs, but what's happening out there? How are we looking at it and what do we know about what are the societal changes that comes out of what we do? So quickly going through, um, you know, an incident which happened literally two weeks ago in Bangalore. If you're interested in the outcome of this incident, I'll talk about it at the end. Uh, can one of you read this for me? One audience mic, please. You can. You're loud enough? Thank you. Uh, should I face this side? Or this? Okay. Uh, let's reflect on this incident. A 32-year-old physician riding a bike in Bangalore, November 2023. Rear ended a lorry at 60 kilometer per hour, three kilometers from his college, conscious, hypotensive with right-sided chest injury, called 108 and taken to his alma mater. Thank you. So this was uh, about 11 o'clock at night. He made the phone call to get an ambulance and he was taken to the college where he trained in. So what happened later, we'll talk about it at the end of the presentation. So we all know what emergency care in India is. We are good at chest thumping and saying we are best in the world in most things, but we do know that uh, the mortality figures, morbidity figures from cardiac arrest or diabetic ketoacidosis, neonatal mortality, postpartum hemorrhage, you name it. Because of our significant population and because of uh, not so well organized pre hospital systems and emergency medicine, which is just evolving in many hospitals, the numbers don't paint a very rosy picture. Most of our 88 percentage of our emergency attendances in India go into non tertiary hospitals. So, PHCs, CHCs, little private hospitals, little suburban hospitals. So, it's an evolution in the making led by bright leaders like Rajkumar, Guna. You've got a few youngsters here who are taking the mantle of emergency medicine and quality and pushing it forward. So we want everybody, not just emergency physicians, to do an early recognition of who is well, who is unwell. And in amongst the who is unwell lot, who is critically unwell and going to die. That recognition triggers your response. And your response is to stabilize them by resuscitating them using the protocols which are evidence driven. Not because my professor said 25 years ago that in cardiac arrest I should do a 3 is to 1. 3 compression, 1 breath. A physician's words from a Taluka hospital. I am not making this up. So things have moved on, but if we are stuck, we will be struggling in saving lives. So after resuscitation, if your sender doesn't have the ability, if you don't have the ability, please send them to the right place for the appropriate care. So there was a survey in 2013 in Karnataka because significant numbers of violence came about, came about the state against healthcare professionals. The survey was done by one Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, an NGO based out of Mysore, which showed that uh, doctors and nurses didn't have any formal skill training to manage emergencies. We know theory, but we didn't know what to do if a heart attack came, if a respiratory arrest came, if a neonate came without breathing. So they requested for seven common groups of emergencies to be trained. Cardiac, respiratory, trauma and burns, stings, bites and all the poisons, obstetric emergencies, neonatal emergencies and pediatric emergencies. Also trauma burns, if I haven't mentioned that. So all this, they were seeing in big numbers because the ambulance system started. People who were dying in the roadside, at workplace, in the fields and homes, suddenly got brought into smaller hospitals. And they didn't know what to do when they were faced with these patients. So with this technical support of uh, University of Utah, and in collaboration with the Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, which is the state university for health sciences in Karnataka, Jeevareksha, the project was started in 2013. And they came about with world's first comprehensive emergency care. So if you look at life support programs, it's either cardiac or trauma or neonatal or pediatric. So you can do capsules. If you look at the cost of these capsules, which are supported by foreign agencies, they add up to a big amount of money. And it's not available in all cities, all smaller tier two cities and other parts of India. You have to travel into somewhere like Bangalore or Chennai or Pondicherry 
and you have to stay here for so many days. The average number of days is 21 to complete all the life support programs. So you can imagine the cost of hotel, travel, you know, and the rest put together, plus expensive foreign courses. Most of our junior doctors, most of our rural doctors, nurses couldn't afford such upskilling. So we needed a make in India solution. And that's where the project came about. So I'm not going to read this. It's very simple. The word Jivaraksha in Sanskrit means protecting or saving lives for those of our uh, guests from overseas. So when we went to Bhutan and done the program and trained about 55 instructors there, they promptly coined the term Druk Sok Chop. Druk is a national uh, emblem, the dragon. And uh, sock chop is saving lives in Bhutanese. So they just, you know, we were very, very happy to see them imbibing it and making it their own, the program and the process of saving lives. So we do not only education and training, but also research, development, relief and rehabilitation. So we were pretty busy during the COVID times. So currently we have these programs. The Comprehensive Emergency Care and Life Support Program is a four-day program for doctors. And it's kind of a finishing school. It is 70 percentage skills, 30 percentage theory. When they walk out, and many have walked out from the classrooms who are sitting here on the dais and otherwise, they walk out with their shoulders held high. You know why? They've been put through the mill. They have the confidence to save a life. They don't walk out thinking, I remember something somebody taught. I might be able to do something. No, they actually know that if they find a patient collapsed, or if they find a bleeding lady, they know exactly what to do to save a life. So the other programs, we started one for nursing because huge demand from our nursing colleagues. The one day program is not just BLS. It has 10 common, the commonest killers in India, whether it is infection or uh, trauma or uh, stroke or heart attack, all these things are included, and what to do in the first 5 to 15 minutes when you come across something like that in the pre-hospital or low resource setting. Anyone with an 8 standard education can uh, take that program. And uh, 8 standard, why? Because we want them to have that level of critical thinking. And in India, one other thing is you have to take the leadership. There are 60 people doing Facebook Live. So you need to step in and say, hey, I'm trained. I need to know what to do. So let's do the right thing. So that is the BCLS. And then from a specialist, we got requests saying that this model works, but our corresponding programs are too expensive. Can we do something for hospital teams? So you've got the trauma, obstetric, and hospital emergencies and life support as the two-day programs. So when we design a course, what are the course objectives? Now, what is it? Is it the Natu Natu song or what, what am I pushing for here? Thank you. So, the RR stands for you have to first find out who is dying, who is critically unwell. Because emergency medicine or emergency response is all about catering to the most unwell, not to look at 100 patients and treat them at the same time. So that triage concept need to come in, you need to resuscitate, you need to refer to the right place. So just the medical course, I've already covered this, so it has all of that and it is heavily skills based. And we use a lot of scenarios. And one of the feedback we've got commonly is when I was faced with the situation, I didn't panic because it felt like one of the scenarios you guys were putting us through. So we've had people collapsing in beach in Pondicherry. We've had strokes in Oroville. We've had people falling from the trees in Oroville for our trauma scenario exam, for example. So we actually insist and make sure that all the scenarios while training as well as testing is locally based, culturally appropriate, so that people can empathize subconsciously with what they would be doing in a real life scenario. So teaching, this is where most of our students will stare at us. It is bootcamp style. It's pretty strict. It is pretty intense. 
and you start early, you might finish late if you don't finish all the ticking all the objectives. It is intense. And lectures are smaller, skills are more. So you can kill the mannequins or the imaginary patient in a scenario as many times as you want. Because we want you to stop killing patients in real life. So we don't mind. You can make mistakes and learn and get to a place where you're safe. And uh, we do technical as well as non-technical. So we do look at the science behind teaching. So procedure skills, uh, you know, we use technical models and the non-technical skills are also looked at uh, in, a, in a significant way. Leadership, communication, teamwork, delegation. And we do mentoring right from the beginning too to make sure that all these elements are observed, documented and we have a Gurukul-like Tejinder sir was saying yesterday about Gurukul system. By the end of the fourth day, the mentors will know inside out of each candidate. We even know about your family, what are your stressors, how you work under stress, all these things. So the friendships we form across the Jivaraksha program are lifelong, even if it is driven by hate or fear. I'm, I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> so, so, so I, I want, want to introduce you to impact. impact. So, so impact is how you would turn around a situation given to you. So the instructor is expected to give a scenario to the candidates. What's the candidate expected to do? They're given two to five minutes. They're supposed to first imbibe. Something is said, you know, 36 year old, primary para, uh, abdominal pain, leaking, inner road traffic collision, not wearing seat belt because of uh, abdomen protruding, coming into you with conscious moaning and pain and we will give a set of vital signs. So the candidate is supposed to take in the information significantly, okay? And understand what are all elements are there, and then we are not pushing them into the scenario yet. They need to mediate. They need to mediate with their team members because you are always a team leader when we give you a scenario. Then prepare. You have to get the kit. You have to Think about the procedures you might be using, you, might to, you have to think about the protocols you might be using, all those things you need to prepare. Then, once the patient is with you, act in the appropriate role and lead the team in saving the patient's life. It doesn't finish there. Most simulation will end at the candidate acting out or going through the motions of doing the clinical intervention. Here, we then want them to complete the session by giving what we call a, what is the file summary that we say? I'm not hearing any of you shouting. What are we, how are we supposed to communicate with them? I-S-B-A-R, I haven't got it as a slide. So what is this bar? So introduce yourself and find out who you're talking to. What is S? Situation, what was the initial situation you ended up with? B is? Background, A is? Yeah, what is your assessment and what was your actions? What kind of resuscitation did you do? And R is? So asking for advice if you're referring the patient, recommendations and telling them to review things. You might have done half a something, like you might have given glucose in a hypoglycemic patient, you might have put a drip, but you definitely want the patient's blood sugar to be monitored when the patient gets into the higher center. This communication is vital. About 20 percentage mortality you can reduce in an emergency patient if, if you, you use ISBA as a communication tool. So this is also taught and people are trained in it, so they are comfortable with it. So the last one is transfer. Again, any number of news articles we read about neonates being transferred and dying because the oxygen tank emptied or the defibrillator not working or the syringe pump stopping to work or even the ambulance driver not knowing where to go. Simple things take lives. So safe transport is also very important in saving lives. So what kind of simulation modalities do we use? We have simulated participants as in not the participant in the course, but we'll have volunteers and others coming in. We have task trainers, low-tech full-body mannequins and enhanced use using mullah. So we might put blood, we might put other things to make it look like a trauma victim or whatever else we are simulating. And if available, we'll use high-tech mannequins as well. 
So, so simulation and scenarios are a very important part, but it doesn't mean all the courses are driven only through very expensive and high fidelity setups. Okay. So, what do we do other than that? We are also collaborating with uh, organizations like Merkel Haptics from IIT, Madras, and uh, Medicine you've seen outside, Adit is here somewhere. So, our, our own companies, we are collaborating them, with them in developing VR, MR, or AR models, depending upon what we require. So, the Merkel Haptics model that we developed was somebody having a collapse in the 11 kilometer long beach in Chennai with those are shop nearby and you are hearing the sounds of the birds in Chennai. Not always the high street in New York or London. And the guy who is collapsing is not the well built six pack guy. You will see this in simulation over and over again. It is always a Caucasian with perfect health. But he is collapsing in cardiac arrest. No. This is a pot bellied, swarthy, dusky skinned, Tamilian bald man who is about 50 year old. So this is kind of what we commonly see. So even in simulation, you need to push through your narratives and your environments. So are you saying you want a model for that man? <laughs> You're not there yet. So uh, we are collaborating with Merkel and Medicine also. We have uh, signed an MOU in developing modules as well as doing research. So assessment. I know this conference is all about assessment. How do you assess? So we have some components which are in there like, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the formative we have the 360 degree feedback and we have the mentoring and in the summative we got the higher order thinking skills MCQs and uh, OSCE for OSCE scenarios for procedural stations. So nothing like even if, if we are giving them an airway station, we are not telling them intubate. Never. Like Sidharaman sir said yesterday about uh, how he used to conduct medical exams, it's always a story. COPD patient, 50 year old, so many packs of cigarettes per day coming to you with X, Y, Z, what are you going to do? Then they have to go through the motions. It might be a procedural skill, but there's always a story and the vital signs and that positive stress that we put the candidate in to get them feel the realistic pressure of saving a life of an acutely unwell patient. So that is there and when you're a team leader, and when we're looking at other skills, the non-technical skills, decision-making skills and others, we put you into an immersive scenario. You are there, right in the middle of receiving a 24-year-old who has fallen off a Duke 390, for example, coming in with barely a blood pressure, bleeding out from a limp arterial bleed. Many of you can remember, maybe memory, maybe dream, maybe nightmare, I don't know. But that kind of pressure, and if you don't do things in the right order at the right time, you will lose the patient and you have to come back. So we don't believe in failing. We believe every second attempt, every third attempt is an opportunity to relearn. Okay? And uh, this module is adaptable to low and high resource settings. So if you give me a lab with all high fidelity mannequin, we will fly through, no issues. We've got preset scenarios, simulation stations, all the numbers are all pre written up. You can just fly through. If you don't have it, we'll still fly. And the candidate wouldn't know a big difference. The whole point is that the candidate feels the urge to do something quickly based on the evidence to save a life. So, program evaluation, how do we go? So, we use the New World Kirkpatrick model. And you are experts in that compared to me, the level one, two, three, and four. So one and two is pretty much covered during the program itself. There's feedback taken from candidate. There's before the course itself, we look at their confidence by doing a pre-course survey in all the components we are teaching them. Out of 10, how much do you feel confident in managing somebody coming in with poisoning or somebody losing airway, etc. After the course, the survey is repeated. We also take feedback of each session, sometimes a bit onerous. Every theory, every practical session, and even uh, scenario moulage we are showing before we send them off for trauma training or airway training, we take feedback. Instructor feedback is also sought. And then we have the three where they tell us after getting back to their workplace, we get on-site feedback from our students. Yesterday, I came across somebody, I did this or did that, saved a life. 
And one of the outcomes we are looking at is, we don't believe that healthcare professionals, or even for that matter, citizens who are trained in any of our programs, are static. As in, you're in a hospital, you're a lifesaver. You're outside a hospital, you're not. Nothing like that. The conversion is from a jobbing medic or a nurse or whatever with a title saying you are so-and-so to a 24-7 lifesaver. So that's one of the outcomes. And we are getting in some of those feedback also in the level four loop. And we're doing some research looking at all the providers and instructors from 2014 till date and asking them certain questions and going to their workplaces to assess how this training has changed, you know, and how much of an outcome we are getting. So, talked about that. Thank you. So, this is some of that kind of, you know, level three feedback. So, one is from a PHC and the other is from overseas. Syed Mohsen uh, sort of contacted us from Wales. He's an orthopedic surgeon who was against the training initially. He felt forced because I'm an orthopod. Why should I train about NRP? Why should I train how to do CPR? I just need to fix bones. At a push, I'll do ATLS, but none, none of this. And that comes from Syed. And that ambulance took 20 minutes to reach that kid, even though it is in a first world country, as they call it. And this is from one of our PhDs in the coast in Karnataka. I can share the PowerPoint with you to read the stories later. So again, a bunch of feedback from our nursing students. I just wanted to focus on the middle top one. One of the most pessimistic students, I don't know how to stand in a crowd, I will freeze. I get panic attacks. And then that kid turning around and saying, look, I'm very confident in managing. So that comes from your mentoring, that constant supervision, support, and creating a positive training environment. So journey so far started in 2013, and I've talked about all this. Now we've got those numbers as our numbers in training or as providers now. Signed multiple MOUs, trained outside India too. And, um, you know, life whether it is a cute, smiling Bhutanese kid, as in this uh, case, or a Sri Lankan kid, or a Pakistani kid, is same value. But how much value do we give life in our country is a question we should all ask. Is it too cheap? Do people die too easily? Do we not try hard to save a life? And uh, compared to the established system in other countries, I feel that we could do a lot more. And that is the relevance of Jivaraksha. So that's your summary. And we are constantly evolving and upgrading as the evidence change and as per the feedback. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Amazing talk. Uh, can I take questions from sure, the audience? Sure. Are there any questions? What happened to the bike? Ah, that is. <laughs> I wanted that question to come at the end, but we'll go to that then. I'm sorry, it is not good news. So he was taken into one of the best emergency departments in Bangalore, and this, you know, it just happened a few weeks ago. Uh, he needed a chest drain, but that drain was placed in the subcutaneous space. So he became worse, he died, and afterwards it was discovered that in the, it was in the wrong place. So we say to everyone in emergency medicine, reassess, reassess, reassess. You really have to go back and look at all your interventions and go to the thing which kills first and come down slowly. So a little faux pas and a 32-year-old guy from the same medical college uh, is not with us anymore to tell me a good story. And um, you know, if you look at two success stories, you will have about 80 problem stories in our current setup. In India, pre-hospital cardiac arrest, one in 10,000 live and go back home with any quality of life. In Seattle, it is 6,800 people out of 10,000 go back home with quality of life and had to bring in cardiac arrest. So there's that amount of length, you know, distance and height we need to go to get our systems working well for us. 
Yes, sir. Thank you for your uh, great presentation. Thank you. I'm Sayako Ikawa, uh, emergency medicine in Japan. And in Japan, we also have this kind of systematic uh, training course with using simulation technique. And now we have several problems, uh, pro practical problems, to gather, um, you know, to ask person to be a uh, faculty, uh, instructors, because they are too busy to have time to teach uh, the novice learners. And sometimes they cannot have um, time and also financial issues. We are struggling with that kind of things. And recently, only some people who are enthusiastically uh, in education, they are working so hard in uh, teaching this kind of training course. So do you have such kind of problems in India context? Uh, great question, thank you. Uh, this problem is universal and it can be solved. We have uh, solved that problem in a unique way. So when 2013 the Jivaraksha project was started, at the same time, without any consultation, up in Delhi, something called National Emergency Life Support was started. So they spent around 400 crores in uh, seven years and they had 16 instructors and 16 providers because there was one clause which said only specialists can teach that particular specialty. So only a pediatrician or a neonatologist was allowed to teach neonatal resuscitation protocol. Only an orthopedician or a surgeon was allowed to teach trauma. So which meant the problem you are suggesting was even more acute and we haven't gone through the numbers we wanted to see. What we do in Jivaraksha is, at the MBBS level, at the graduate level, all of us are expected to know certain life-saving skills. So intubating a patient rightly is not rocket science. Doing a proper CPR is not difficult. Doing a chest strain is not difficult. So we use our pre, para, and clinical staff. We don't insist on and uh, what we find is uh, our pre para group of teachers are some of the most enthusiastic and proficient teachers in doing this program because they're coming back into the fold, so to speak. And uh, there is this anecdote often said about most Indian doctors don't put doctor before you book a train ticket or a plane ticket. We don't want to be disturbed. We don't want to be seen. One of the feedback in there was from an intern who was flying to US. And a lady collapsed, he was, you know, they asked for a doctor, none of the doctors put their hand up, this intern put their hand up because he's ECL strained. And he went in, it was a lady who was unconscious. Cardiac arrest is easy to manage. Mortality is high, protocol is bang on there. When somebody is unconscious, but still with a blood pressure, it is more difficult. But the kid managed well, and they gave him an up and down business uh, class ticket from United Airlines and respected him so much. So. Uh, to teach those skills and he was taught by majority non-clinical as people say or you know pre-para group of teachers so we believe that this can be done with all group of trainers another thing we're doing is we're introducing an LMS system learning management system where theory will be take, uh, taken care of self-directed learning and they come to the course after passing the uh, theory test at 70 percentage mark only then they'll get into the practical scenario simulation based setting. So that makes the learning easier for the students and teaching easier for the uh, teachers because the concepts are already there. So this is how we solve that issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? We can. Uh, good morning. Dr. Ram, this is a great presentation and the team of Jeeva Raksha is really inspiring and you are serving the community. Thank so you. So I'm from, I'm from Mangalore, Manipal, but uh, 10 years back I moved to American University of Antigua College of Medicine where we have USMLE curriculum. So there is a EMT, EMT department. So they train our medical students in year one. They give mandatory BLS certification. It is in the schedule. So then in year two, they have to do ACLS. Do we have that type of curriculum incorporated in our medical schools, like whether it is any, any university it is there, like they have to do it? Short answer is yes. Just recently, it has come through for the first years to have BLS training. Mm -hmm. And for the final year students as well as postgraduates to have 
ACLS like training because you know, these terms have been mentioned. Mm -hmm. Many institutions are doing it, especially the first year one is being covered. And uh, uh, the postgraduate final year student one is getting into it because this came only a few years ago. But that's there for medicine. Nursing also, BLS is um, uh, mandatory at some point in their training. For the others, I haven't come across. If other experts in the room know about allied health and other specialties, is there anything? Yes, ma'am? Yes. Is it mandated by the it council? It is not a mandate, sir. But you're doing uh, it. Yes, sir. Yes, thank uh, you. For the job purpose, they can uh, use the certificate for this. Fantastic. Thank you. University, yes. Sir, can I ask and, uh, a question? Sure. Uh, Ten years of Jeeva Raksha Trust, have you any uh, information of the change you have made in Karnataka in the society? How many minutes have I got? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'll do a you know, three-minute answer to that. When you're working in the NGO space, uh, it is not easy on a day-to-day -day basis to be uh, sort of achieving targets and pushing for change. Change, we find in our experience, is best made by the policy makers who are within the government loop. It is much easier at that level. But over the last few years, the policy makers have become friends, some admirers because of the persistent, that kind of, that woodpecker-like persistence of the pig-headedness of us in trying to achieve the goal. So now, uh, I'm proud to say that Karnataka has taken up two big projects. One is the STEMI project. Tamil Nadu started in India by pushing for thrombolysis or stent for ST elevation, myocardial inf infarction uh, for gender population. Okay, and uh, on that STEMI India project, Karnataka has now started and Jivaraksha is delivering the training for the doctors and nurses, first in identifying an MI with ST elevation and doing the check for thrombolysis and also importantly, safe transfer and communication to the receiving center. So the phase one they did with some agency and they've come back and said, can you take up phase one and phase two? So we'll be covering more than 10,000 doctors and others through that program. Another one is RASTA. RASTA is a rapid response assessment stabilization and safe transport in highway accidents. So we know you, li you like terms which are popular across India and Rasta in uh, our language means the way, the path. So Rasta is for trauma and trauma mortality in India is more than two and a half lakhs documented per year, the highest in the world. 40 percentage of those deaths come from preventable extremity hemorrhage, something which can be stopped with a bit of pressure or a tunicate. But we are losing nearly a 1 lakh, 100,000 people every year from preventable external bleeding. So this project, the RASA project is training volunteers, about 160 around each trauma hotspot. Trauma hotspot is uh, detected by the Ministry of Road Transport, higher death area. So we are doing a 5 kilometer radius, 160 volunteers who will be responding to a call when an accident happens. And then we are also training, this is team training, multidisciplinary team training using scenarios and simulation for receiving hospitals. About 60 of the treating doctors and nurses are being trained in how to receive a trauma patient as a team. And forget your seniority, you might be the senior most orthopedician and senior most member in the team, but the head injury or the chest injury will take precedence in the management strategy. Uh, sorry, I'm not picking on orthopedicians all the time. I've got too many friends in orthopedics and I'm a surgeon myself. So that's the only reason I don't have anything against orthopedicians. But it is not on seniority, but what kills first. They are trained to tackle the patient and we're doing audits to see if that has worked. The pilot project has gone through and uh, the rest is uh, under submission for uh, fund release and we'll be going across Karnataka. So that will be a model that other states also can follow. And this is inspired by, I have to say, Trauma link from Bangladesh. How many of you have heard of trauma link? A simple intervention of training volunteers to go in motorcycles to detect cervical spine injury, head injury, and tying of bleeds. Just non-medical people coming in motorcycle through Dhaka, where the traffic is pretty bad. Then they will ensure that the patient gets to the right hospital. For our country, getting to the right hospital is very important. So they reduce mortality by about 40% on the roads. And uh, we sort of read that paper, looked at the work they've done, 
and we've kind of borrowed some of the ideas but made it even more intense in tackling the death rates in India. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So this is uh, kind of connecting what she was asking whether curriculum integration. So what we have done is uh, we have a two week slot we have created for skill lab training and second MBBS course. This is not mandated, but we have created that space so that we could teach them, reinforce the BLS which has been taught in first year, and also first aid we teach at that point of time. Recently, we had an incident where there is a construction going on, and one of the electricians was electrocuted, and he fell down in the hospital main area, uh, the construction building. All were watching. Two second year students, they were passing by, they stop, they ensured scene safety, they actually gave uh, initial resuscitation, they called for ambulance, shifted the patient to ER, and they were with them, with the, the patient and in the ER for half an hour till uh, uh, the patient actually, he was declared dead, but still, they were just second year students entering into second year students and they did that. So that, that is the impact which we are talking about. That's a societal change right there in AVMC from local work, from the most unexpected of uh, candidates. Well done, ma'am and team. Thank you. Uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Ram, uh, just a last question. It recently happened, I work, you know, in Malaysia, so I, what happened was the, uh, generally, uh, I'm an ophthalmologist, by the way, we don't actually keep any anesthesiologists, no emergency team, because all daycare. But unfortunately, it doesn't really happen, but it happened that the patient, we at least we realized that he, he had a heart attack while operating. But the thing is, the surgeon also kind of, his BP went up and he collapsed. So what is the thing that you would advise? We are all junior doctors and, you know, few, uh, you know, medical officers. So what could have been essential in that kind of a situation, please? Thank you. Uh, before answering the question, I was looking around the room. I was looking for the ENT interns from AVMC. They said they'll be here, and this is an answer which is most prime for the juniors amongst us, because over the years we kind of get into some sort of survival system, some sort of self-care mechanisms. Uh, so, breathing. Now, we all breathe, but how do we breathe? So if you're aware of your breath, and if you can control the rate of breathing, then your heart rate can be modulated, your blood pressure can be modulated, and your brain doesn't go fussy with too much of stuff coming through. So our autoimmune or the pre you know, parasympathetic and uh, sympathetic systems get into action the moment we are in stress. When a child comes in, pediatric cardiac arrest is my nightmare. You really don't want to lose that baby. But you know that if a child goes into cardiac arrest, the chances of getting it back is pretty grim. Okay, unless it is a sort of exposure to hypothermia or electrocution or something like that. So that is my kind of nemesis situation. What you do? You have to really take a deep breath, calm this thing down, get the protocols out, get the Breslau tape out, get your team around you. Calling for help is not just for cardiac arrest. Calling for help is for any emergency situation. And like in disaster management or any other thing in life, preparedness and practice gets you to be resilient to deal with situations like that. So if you're not prepared, if you've never done a moulage or a trial, and you are in that sort of adrenaline rushed zone, we are pretty much useless to managing an emergency condition where the parameters could be varied. Somebody might come with an ST elevation, ECG, and unconscious. How many of you will thrombolize that patient straight away? ST elevation in all leads. Leave them with a little question. ST elevation in all the leads, not just uh, lateral, inferior, anterior. Patient is unconscious. You can't get any history. Show of hands for how many will go for thrombolysis. Let's say there's no stent available. Patient is dying. I've got one ophthalmologist who's brave. <laughs> so how many won't thrombolize? Let's put it the other way around. 
ST elevation everywhere and there are two saying I won't thrombolyze. You don't have stent, you don't have cardiologist, you're in a low resource setting. You've only got, you know, you've got a one hour to get to anywhere to refer. So that's the situation. How many of you won't thrombolyze? That also no answer. So what I'm pushing for is subarachnoid hemorrhage can give you ST elevation. So if you're not calm, to think about the differential, look at the patient and see if this is clinically this condition or that condition in an emergency when you don't have all the investigation results back, when you have to really act right now, right here, you need that calmness. And being mindful, being in control of your own respiratory rate helps a lot is what my personal experience is. Hope that helps you too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Thank you for the audience. I think it was a fantastic start to day three. Very engaging, very inspiring. Ram is going to be with us for the rest of the day. I'm sure there's so many other questions and insights that you'd like to get from him. So please meet him in the coffee break and we can continue the conversation. Thank you to my co-chair as well and to the ICON team. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the superlative session. May I now uh, request Dr. Sheila Kurvila and Dr. Praveen Jacob to honor Dr. Ram Nayar. As they're getting ready to honor me, you can't understate the importance of organizers of this conference to give a non-traditional medical educator a stage like this to talk about our experiences because it's so easy to bring the known parameters and explore what you already know. Uh, I'm a total outsider and outlier, so thank you so much for having me on stage here and talk about our experience. Thank you, sirs. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Ambujam, Director of Research Medicine, Karekal VMRF, to honor our chairpersons, Dr. Sheila Kurvila and Dr. Praveen Jacob. 